Hi, welcome to chapter two on molecular interactions. So in this chapter, we're gonna talk about atoms, ions, and molecules. So a little bit of chemistry, including chemical bonds. We'll talk about our different biomolecules and then end with solutions and pH. So atoms are the building blocks of all matter. And structurally, atoms are made up of protons, electrons, and neutrons. So protons are positively charged because, um, I mean, they have a plus because they're positively charged. Electrons have a negative sign because they're negatively charged. And the neutrons here in red have nothing because they are neutral. So an atom has an equal number of protons and electrons. So two pluses, two minuses. So overall, it gives a um, total charge of zero. In the nucleus, you can see you find the heaviest, which are your protons and your neutrons. And then you have your electrons that float around in your electron shells or your orbitals. Now, if you take a look at any um, science book, you have your periodic table. And if we take a look at the periodic table, um, some of these elements we call our essential elements. So the essential elements are the ones that are required for life. And examples include oxygen, carbon, hydrogen. And I mentioned those three because they actually make up more than 90% of your body's mass. So I like to think of them as CHO, C-H-O, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Some of your elements are known as trace elements because they are still required for life, but only in trace amounts. Um, now, if we take a look at the periodic table, um, they have, you have these boxes with an atomic symbol to tell you what the symbol is. And the number on top is your atomic number. Now, the atomic number is unique for each element, but it also tells you the number of protons that that element has. Uh, the number on the bottom is the atomic mass that tells you how much it weighs. Now, protons and neutrons both weigh one atomic mass unit or one Dalton. So if you have two protons, because the atomic number tells us that, and if, they, if a proton and a neutron both weighs one and the atomic mass is four, then the way that you got a weight of four is because you had two protons and you had two neutrons. Now, how many electrons does helium have? Well, it has two. How do I know that? Because I said... Um, your atoms are neutral. So if you have two protons, pluses, you have to also have two electrons, minuses, to make it neutral. Um, what else do I want to talk about here? Okay, so um, things can change, however. So, for example, you can have different numbers of neutrons than what the periodic table tells us. And when you have a different number of neutrons than normal or what you thought, um, then we have an isotope. Now, if you become an isotope, because you're changing the number of neutrons, which is one of the heavier um, parts of your atom, then you'll also change the atomic mass. Now, isotopes are used in things like uh, medical tracers. Um, we're really not going to talk too much about isotopes in this class. We are, however, going to talk a lot about ions. And ions are made when you have different numbers of electrons. Uh, so when you change the number of electrons, you don't change the atomic mass because the electrons are so light, but you do change your overall charge. So if this helium atom gained an electron, it's going to be uh, more negative than normal. So it has a little minus sign. And if it loses an electron, then it's going to become more positive because it'll have your two pluses, but only one minus. The overall charge will be a plus one. So then you become um, a cation. So anions are what we call negatively charged ions, and then cations are for positively charged. And if you have a different number of protons than normal, then you become a completely different element because every element has a unique number of protons. Um, so <clears throat> what are the role of some of these electrons um, that we have in our body? So electrons are involved in covalent bonds, and we'll talk about covalent bonds more, but they are the strongest bonds that hold atoms together to create molecules. Then we also have ions. So again, ions are made when you lose or gain an electron. So here we have sodium ion. Notice sodium Na has a little plus. Um, this is a plus of one. So what that tells you is, is it lost one electron to have an overall charge of plus one. Ionic bonds, um, electrons are involved in those. So basically, um, this is when your ions, your cations, and your anions, which are opposite charges, pluses and minuses, they attract, and that attraction creates a chemical bond. And then free radicals. So free radicals are molecules with unpaired electrons, and electrons don't like to be unpaired. So what these guys are going to do is they're going to go around and steal electrons, and that really causes damage within your cells, which is why 
you're always kind of told to take antioxidants because what they do is they give um, a, a free radical electrons without becoming damaged itself. So um, what is the difference between molecules and compounds? So we put atoms together to create molecules. So a molecule is just a general term that describes atoms um, linked by chemical bonds. A compound is a molecule, but they're made up of different types of atoms bound together. So if we have oxygen gas, it's two oxygens bound together, so that's a molecule. Glucose is also a molecule, but it's made up of six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens bound together. So notice they are different elements as carbon, hydrogen, and oxygens bound together, so they are a compound. So all compounds are molecules, but not all molecules are compounds. So let's talk about the different types of bonds we use to make <coughs> our molecules. Uh, the first one, which I mentioned earlier, are your covalent bonds, your strongest bonds. What happens in your covalent bonds is basically you pair, you share pairs of electrons. So here's water molecule. Notice the electrons are being shared between hydrogen and oxygen, and that sharing creates a really strong bond. Another thing I want you to notice about water is that the way that the electrons are distributed, um, we end up creating pools. So notice this part of water has a lot more electrons than this side. So we create a partial negative pole and a partial positive pole. This polarity um, is quite important because what it tells us is something like this is going to dissolve very easily in water. So if you dissolve easily in water, it means you like water. So we say you are hydrophilic. If you're not polar, if you have no pluses or minuses or poles, um, then you don't dissolve well in water. So you don't like water. So we call you hydrophobic. Another type of bond <coughs> used to create chemicals are ionic bonds. Ionic bonds are also very strong. Um, this is where you're going to transfer an electron. So here we have our sodium, our chlorine. Our sodium is going to give an electron to chlorine. So sodium loses an electron, so it becomes a cation. The chlorine atom gains an electron, so it becomes an anion. And then what do opposite charges do? They attract, and that's how you get your sodium chloride. Uh, then we have our two weak bonds. This would be your hydrogen bond and your van der Waals forces. So hydrogen bonds are weak and partial, meaning um, they, they can form and break, etc. But it's very specific. So it's between hydrogen, hence the name hydrogen bond, and a nearby fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. So the hydrogen can only form these hydrogen bond with, bonds with these three atoms. So water would be a great example of where you have a lot of hydrogen bonds. So here you have your water molecule, your H2O. So the H's and O's here are connected to each other through covalent bonds. But the hydrogen from this water molecule has a weak bond, hence the dashed line, to the oxygen of this other water molecule. Now the hydrogen bonds in water is what gives water its surface tension, its boiling temperature, freezing temperature, etc. This is why you can um, kind of fill water to the top of a cup and then kind of overfill it because the hydrogen bonds will kind of hold it together, but one too many drops, it, it'll spill because it's weak and partial. The final weak bond is your van der Waals forces. They're weak and not specific, so it is basically the attraction between any nucleus of one atom to the electron shells of another. Why would they be attracted? Because opposite charges attract. The nucleus has the pluses, the electron shells have the negatives. So these bonds um, help create your molecules and it gives your molecule its shape. And shape is closely related to function. And that is why anatomy is important because anatomy you learned about shape, structure. Now I wanna go into our different biomolecules. So we have our carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleotides, and nucleic acids. So carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are the most abundant and they are made up of CHO, C-H-O, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And they have this general formula, CH2O. So if we take a look at glucose, the um, N would be six. So it's made up of six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. And um, carbohydrates all have this kind of typical ring structure. We have our simple carbohydrates, our monosaccharides, mono meaning one, so fructose, glucose, galactose. Our disaccharides die for two, so our um, sucrose is made up of a glucose and a fructose. 
Our maltose is made up of two glucoses, and then our galactose is made up, I'm sorry, our lactose is made up of a glucose and a galactose. And then we have our complex polymers, our polysaccharides, poly for many. So glycogen would be the best example. That's just a bunch of glucose stuck together, and that's how we store glucose in our body. The next biomolecule are your lipids. Lipids are also made up of CHO, C-H-O, but only a little, a little bit of the O. And these guys are nonpolar, so they don't like water. They are hydrophobic. Um, oh, this is supposed to be not. They are not water-soluble. Um, in their liquid form, they are, the, they are oils, and their solid form, they're your fats. And structurally, they're pretty diverse. The most common and most uh, important um, lipid in the body is your triglyceride, tri for three, so it's made up of a glycerol backbone and one, two, three fatty acid chains. But notice um, we have also um, steroids, our cholesterol, um, and they have like these ring structures, so they don't all look the same. Um, and then we have our phospholipids, which hopefully you guys are familiar with already. They make up your phospholipid bilayer. Now, I want to point out cholesterol is not all bad. We do need it. It is the source of our steroids for our steroid hormones. So cholesterol is not all bad. The next biomolecule um, are your proteins. Now, proteins are uh, made up of amino acids, and there are 20 amino acids, and some of them we call our essential. Now, this one's a little bit different. Um, we need all amino acids. The essential ones are the ones um, that we cannot synthesize, so they have to be obtained through our diet. Protein structure, if we take a look, um, when we make our protein, if we take an amino acid shown here and we put kind of a couple together, we have our oligopeptide, and then we have our polypeptides uh, when there's a little bit more amino acid stuck together, and then when it's really big, we have our protein. Now, how do we bond, combine amino acids together? Through bonds, and specifically because these bonds hold proteins or amino acids together to create proteins, we call them peptide bonds. Now, when we make our protein, we have different kind of steps in the process. So the first step is where we create our primary structure, and this is just a sequence of amino acids stuck together. So here we have four amino acids stuck together by one, two, three, peptide bonds. You'll always have one less bond than the number of amino acids. So if you have 100 amino acids, then you'll have 99 peptide bonds. Then what we do is we allow this uh, protein structure to kind of fold on its own, and it'll fold typically into an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. So that's our secondary structure. And then we'll let that fold on top of itself. And so that's how we get our tertiary structure, one, two, three, and then the last step are quaternary structures when we have multiple kind of tertiaries coming together to create our final protein. Now, we've only talked about three of the biomolecules, but I do want to mention that they are not exclusive, meaning you can combine these guys with each other. So a lipoprotein is essentially a lipid and a protein that's stuck together. A glycoprotein, for glyco, think of glycogen, carbohydrates, so it's a carbohydrate and a protein. And then a glycolipid would be a carbohydrate and a lipid. Our last biomolecule are your nucleotides and nucleic acids. <coughs> um, they do two important things. They transmit and store information, and they transmit and store energy. So for information, we're talking about our DNA and our RNA, our genetic code. For energy, we're really talking about ATP. Now, we also have other forms of energy like NAD, FAD, but ATP is really the most important one um, that we'll be talking about in this class. So here's a look at our DNA. Um, I know it's DNA because it's double-stranded. And over here, we have our RNA, and I know it's RNA because it's single-stranded. I also know it's RNA because it has that little U. So our DNA is made up of four nucleotides. We have our adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. And this is how they pair up. So adenine binds to thymine, guanine binds to cytosine. Um, this is what your DNA looks like. RNA also pairs like this, except the thymine is replaced with uracil in RNA. Okay, so that's where that U comes in. And RNA is, RNA is also single-stranded. So this is how we store our genetic code, our information. It tells us everything about ourselves. And um, there we go. Okay. 
So those are our four biomolecules. Now I'm gonna move on to our solutions. So aqueous solutions, why is that important? Because the human body is 60% water. Um, and we have substances dissolved in the water. So just to kind of get some vocabulary out of the way, a solute is the substance that's gonna be dissolved in liquid. The solvent is the liquid. So if I put sugar into water, sugar would be the solute, uh, water would be the solvent. And then when I create, you know, stir it, and then I dissolve it, I have my sugary water solution, okay? So the solution is a combination of the solute and the dissolved solvents. Now the solubility describes how easily a solute dissolves in the solvent. So again, remember if you like water, we say you are hydrophilic. We're doing that first, you like, so hydrophilic. And so you would have a high solubility. So again, if you are polar, if you have charged, um, or if you're charged, then you're gonna like water. If you are hydrophobic, you don't like water. And so you're, you would have low solubility. This is why um, oils and water don't mix, okay? And then we're going to end with pH. So pH tells us the power of hydrogen. So we're really looking at um, hydrogen ions. So the greater the amount of hydrogen ions, shown here in red. So as you go down, hydrogen ions are actually increasing. Um, you are becoming more and more acidic. Notice your pH number is becoming um, much lower. As your hydrogen ion number decreases, showing um, this arrow going up, you have less and less hydrogen ions, your pH number actually goes up, and so you're becoming more alkaline or more basic. So seven really would be neutral. And so things like your stomach acid has a pH of, here it says one, but it's actually pH of two. Um, so it's a really acidic environment. Um, and then things like household ammonia is more um, alkaline. And really quickly, buffers. Buffers are important in the body because they help minimize changes to pH. And the most important buffer in our body is going to be bicarbonate ion, which we'll learn about as well as we progress through the term. Okay, so that is a summary of chapter two. Um